Uh, they get along most of the time, but he's been kind of like, they, uh, basically, they're puppies of about the same age, um, been interacting their whole lives. Uh, at one point, I had like a nightingale collar on okay. it, and uh, they were playing. The other dog got caught up in the collar, yeah. and it was like choking him. Okay. Ever since then, he's been a little more with that dog. Okay. And on occasion, he sort of snaps at him, but in the past, it's always been like, the other dog's kind of clumsy and stuff, so he'll come like flying into the kitchen, like slide across the floor and collide into him, okay. and that would cause something. This last time, though, we literally had just like, we had drained a kiddie pool, he was just kind of like sniffing the water that had come out, the other dog came over to sniff it, and he straight attacked him. It okay. didn't seem like there was any real thing that should have triggered it. Oh, uh, was it bad? Uh, he <laughs> put some cuts on his ear, but we were able to separate them pretty quickly. Okay. It, it only ever seems to happen because we have always been able to leave them alone. together, mm -hmm. alone. It only ever seems to happen particularly when I'm present, because I don't think my parents, when they've been watching them, have ever had an incident. Interesting, sure. Okay. But, like, I wasn't nearby or anything like that. Okay. How old? Uh, about three years. How long have you had the other dog? Uh, my parents' dog? Or, or the one the that, other one that yeah. he lives with. The one he lives with. Uh, about five years. Okay, so he came in to the yes. picture. I see. How long, uh, when did you get him? Um, he was, they told me eight weeks, but he was, he couldn't even eat solid food, so I think it might have been closer to six. Sure, okay. Um, so he's going up with that other dog. Um, so you had an instance where, like, uh, one the other dog's mouth got stuck in the martingale. Yeah, and as he was trying to free himself, he was just tightening around him. Yeah, yeah. Like, so there was panic there. The first, like, blood vessels in his eye and stuff like that. And then uh, one time, the other dog, like, crashed into him, right? Yeah, there have been a couple incidents where it seemed like the other dog just, like, caught him really by surprise. Okay. And he reacted like that, but in this case, he knew the dog was there, you know, there should have been absolutely no surprise, and it didn't seem like, you know, there wasn't, like, food or a toy or anything like that. Mm -hmm. There was just some water on the ground. What are you doing, buddy? Has he ever uh, uh, started a fight over food or a toy? No. No? Okay. Yeah, because that instance to me, I know for us, especially because you haven't seen it before, sounds like resource guarding. Mm -hmm. Because he was smelling it, he was interested in it. Uh, even though to us were like it's just empty kiddie pool water for whatever reason and it's rare it's super rare that a dog would guard water but it could happen mm -hmm. okay because uh the, the once you explained it like the first thing i thought was resource guarding mm -hmm. and then to the owner or to the average dog owner it doesn't make sense because like it just because you're as a human logical and you're able to just kind of deduce right whereas for the dog for whatever reason in that setting it just triggers that instinct okay um so, and, and a lot of times, like the most obvious kind of example, or the most obvious explanation is, is that kind of the explanation. Yeah. So that's how I would take that as. Um, there's already stuff that I'm uh, seeing now also. Is there any other information that I should know about Cassius? Um, I don't know, can you give me anything more specific? Uh, like, just like right now, like is this how he is? Um, he's being a little more excited than usual. This is a new place. Yeah. Um, and most places we go, I have my other dog with me as well. Okay. Um, he does definitely, like, my other dog can actually be a little more, like, leash reactive and everything. Okay. With, like, him, every other dog, I'm not really worried about having him interact with. Okay. My other dog can be a little more reactive to other dogs. Okay. And, like, for example, uh, if he starts growling or something in another dog, he'll actually try to, like, grab the, the leash. leash and uh -huh. pull him back. I um, see. I see. Okay. Uh, he, the other dog's fairly protective of him. Okay. Um, what breed is the other dog? Uh, he's a, some kind of bully mix. Okay. Not really sure. He's about 35 pounds, so he's not like a pure pit bull or anything yeah. like that. But it looks like maybe a pit bull cross with like a Frenchie or something. Dog literally just followed me home one day and ended up staying. Sure. Okay. Um... What do you walk that dog on? A harness and a flexi as well, or? Yes, typically. Okay. Have you ever done any other type of training before? Uh, yeah, when I first got him, uh, he, the other dog, or? Either or. Okay, uh, when I first got him, I did some minor off-leash and some with the regular, uh, you know, regular leash just to uh, get him off of the pulling a little bit. Okay. Um, same with the other one. Uh, the other one's got way better with the pulling. Okay. He, 
will still get to the end of the leash and tug a bit, but he doesn't like lean in and try to drag me places. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's about all I can think of in okay. that regard. Okay. Um, before booking this, did you research how we train the methods that we use and everything? Yeah, it looked, uh, well, I researched a bunch of different things and this looked more, everything else looked like the things I've heard before when I've spoken to a lot of trainers and okay. everything and this seemed, well, because I'm very concerned about this uh, particular behavior, behavior I yeah. kind of wanted to make sure I went to something that seemed like it was really you know, going to be effective. Okay. So you're where we use prong and e-collar? Yes. Okay. I uh, have gotten him one, but I've never really started using it. Oh, where did you get it? Uh, I just, it was something off of Amazon. It was like 80 bucks? Something like that. Yeah. If you can return it, I would return it because it's not good. Okay. Oh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I've Long ago? No worries. A year and a half now, so. Yeah. So, um, yeah, definitely always want to work with the professional uh, with applying the e-collar. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Uh, even a lot of professionals don't know how to use it correctly. I mean, I get a lot of dogs that already train on e collar and they have to retrain them because it wasn't done right. Mm -hmm. But at least you're doing your due, due diligence and like working with a professional, right? So I'll explain everything and the kind of what I'm seeing here and stuff. Um, and then potentially what's happening uh, with, with, the, with the scuffles in the home. Oh, uh, one thing I should add uh -huh. uh, after we separated them and then uh, we. You know, had to load them in the car to go. We were out at a family farm and we were going back. Mm -hmm. um, he did not want to get in the car, so he like laid down, refused to get up. Okay. When I went to get his uh, harness yeah. to pick him up, he growled and then he didn't like assertively go to snap at my hand, but uh. it's kind of like he started going for it, then thought better of it. Yeah. And I've never seen that behavior before. Okay. Sure. Uh, good. Good information. Okay. Um, so here, um, I'm picking up a lot of overstimulation and anxiety. Okay. Now you said like, you know, a uh, new environment and stuff. Um, but the, he is very anxious though. I've seen him like run away from a plastic bag in the wind and a stack of <laughs> sure. a pineapple. I gotcha. <laughs> so, but you see like how his inability to like, just sit still, right? He's like all over the place and I understand like it's a new environment, but the fact that you're stationary right now, at some point this should kind of get boring and the dog just like lays down and relaxes, okay? Mm -hmm. So like if I had my pit, for example, and she's like, oh, we're not gonna go anywhere, and she sniffs like all around me, she's like, all right, and she just lays down. Mm -hmm. Unless we start moving again, nothing will really get her interest, right? Mm -hmm. So she learns to settle fairly quickly. Uh, whereas with him, like we got the, the uh, whining as a part of the anxiety, most likely the anxiety is coming from overstimulation um, overstimulation is the brain's inability to relax, okay, or to calm down. That sounds very okay. accurate to his view. Um, because the brain has uh, no capacity to slow down, it can go into anxiety. Because anxiety is also a moving behavior. Mm -hmm. So like uh, we have uh, what I call like the four emotional responses, uh, fear, anxiety, nervousness, um, aggression, anger, okay. Um, so with the anxiety, anxiety wants to move, it paces. Right, so if a person gets anxious, they they have a hard time selling. They might chew on the nails. Just like they have to like get it out, right? So overstimulation. Uh, so anxiety wants to move. Overstimulation also wants to move. But then when it keeps moving, the dog starts to go under stress because they don't know how to calm down. And then potentially anxiety comes out as a result of it. Okay. So I don't always see it, but sometimes I do. This would be a case where I'm seeing a little bit of that. Okay. The anxiety being this whining, right? So then again, the, so like right now, you see how he's still standing and stuff. And he's just, and then like in a little bit, he'll probably like walk over there and a little bit, he'll probably like go over there. Like he's just not chilling out, okay? When really his energy should reflect your energy. What is your energy right now? Pretty relaxed. Yeah, you're calm, right? You're passive, see? No. <laughs> so, um, so that's the overstimulation stuff, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, overstimulation, when the dog goes out into the world, they're already over what we call threshold, right? So we all have a threshold for stress. So if the dog is like already there, any little thing can push them over and like they can become anxious, they can become defensive, blah, 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 leash reactive, right? Um, so, and it sounds like the other guy in the home may potentially have the same thing because you're mentioning stuff like he likes to like run around and he like he doesn't pay attention or something. And oh, like he, the, uh, uh, the, the pity. dog he's had an incident with. Yeah. yeah um, What's his name? His name is Max. Max, Max and Cassius, okay. Yeah, he's a uh, golden lab. Um, oh, okay. Wait, so, so who's the pity? He's my, my other dog in my home. 
Okay. And they've never had an issue. Okay. Uh, this is Max would be my dad's dog. They like live down the street. Uh -huh. They'll stay together a lot, like when I'm at work or stuff like that. Okay. Um, also, we we'll go out on trips. We'll typically try to take the dogs with okay. us. Okay. Um, he's the one that he's had issues with. He's the one that he's had issues with. He's oh, okay. also the one who's the same age. I see. Okay. Because when I read the console for my I, I I read it as like the dog that he's living with, he's having issues or whatever. So it's not the pity. It's it's the golden parent. Lab, ah, I gotcha. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so what's that dog's energy like? Um, he gets pretty energetic. I mean, he gets pretty energetic. And like one thing I had to discourage with him a lot after the uh, collar incident uh -huh. was um, he does like to... When he's trying to play, he'll try to like tackle using his mouth on the neck, uh -huh. which was something that was definitely setting him off. Okay. Um, and he, yeah, that dog generally doesn't listen to me particularly well or my dad particularly well. Okay. My mom a little bit more. Okay. Um, and actually, we've had, I can't think of an incident we've had while my mom's been around. But, okay. Um, yeah, he tends to go bounding into situations quite a bit. Um, okay. And, yeah, he's very hard to get to respond if he gets fixated on something. Yeah. So that also sounds like overstimulation, too. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I'll, 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 like, explain everything, break it down, and kind of, like, realistic expectations. Mm -hmm. Because that dog is also part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because, like, let's say we get him in check. He's doing really well. But the other dog keeps pecking at him or keeps pushing at him and he's like look man i'm just trying to stay out of trouble it'll actually it could potentially pull out a response because he's like i don't want to get in trouble i don't want to be corrected like I'm, I'm i'm chill right and then you just keep being a nuisance to me so nobody addresses that dog that could provoke something nice okay so if it was the other dog in the home it makes it's easier because it's your dog and then you just get them both on the same page but because the dog is external external it's a little bit more complicated yeah. okay so it sounds like with, with with what happened so you had the first incident right which was the martingale one mm -hmm. and i've had something like that happen to another client before that's all panic okay but what ends up what could potentially have happened is in that moment he became defensive and then maybe you guys separated them or whatever they unlatched or whatever but now in his mind he's thinking my defensiveness fixed the problem Okay, the dog doesn't understand it as like, oh, dad came and undid this or whatever. He just thinks I did this, and then shortly thereafter, the thing I didn't like went away or it stopped. Does that make sense? Yes. So then the other one where the dog was running around and crashed into him, he, that's essentially a correction. Okay, we, it's still technically defensiveness, but it makes more sense because he's like, dude, like, don't fucking run into me. Okay, so we, it can be viewed as aggressive, but really in the dog world, that's healthy. He's establishing a boundary. Okay, the last one sounds like resource guarding. So in my mind, the way it makes sense is we had the first response. He became defensive to a degree it worked. Okay, then the dog did something else that he didn't like and he became defensive to a degree it worked. Okay, and then the third time, uh, you know, he's sniffing water or whatever. The dog comes over. He's like, you know what? You're annoying or I don't like you or this is my kiddie pool water. He becomes defensive. Okay, so now we start to see what we call, would call a bully is they start to resort to this behavior more frequently because it's established what he's wanted. And then we had the incident of you, mm -hmm. right? You're trying to load him in the car. He's like, I don't want to go in the car. Yep. He became defensive. That's bully behavior. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. So uh, the good thing is um, uh, bullies, um, he's, he's learning to be a bully as opposed to actually just being a bully. Mm -hmm. Okay, those are two different things. So like, let's say at... Two, two, six weeks or two months, whatever, when you got them, whatever, you'll, you'll literally start to see it already. Okay, so it's just who they are by nature. Nothing good or bad, it's just the dog, okay? But if we don't check it right away, it just grows, and now that dog's just a jerk, okay? In your case, something happened, uh, panic situation, he did something, it worked, and he's just kind of learned to resort to this response because it's getting him what he's looking for. Does that make sense? Yes. Stay with people. You know, people do the same shit, mm -hmm. okay? So it's easier, in my opinion, because it's not really who he is. It's just he's gotten away with it for a few times, and it's created a false sense of confidence and a little bit of an ego, and now he's just starting to kind of employ it where he sees fit. Make sense? Yes. Okay, that's the way I would read all this. 
Um, so the way we end up addressing this is simply adding in structure. Okay. So right now there's no structure. So you have them on a flex leash with the harness, which just so you wear is like the worst combination. Okay. 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 For a couple of reasons. One reason is harnesses um, are meant for pulling. They encourage pulling. Uh, they can also provoke reactivity. Okay. Have you heard of uh, opposition reflex? Not necessarily. No. Opposition reflex uh, is when you pull a, a dog goes against pressure. So if they're pulling forward, our tendency is to pull back, right? Then they want to pull more forward. If they pull back and you pull forward, they'll pull more back. They want to go opposite to pressure. Okay. It's nothing bad. It's just instinctual. Um, but it creates frustration. So many years ago, when I was younger and thinner, I did protection work. Okay. Uh, where we train dogs to aggressively or to be aggressive towards humans on command. Okay, so we could control it. And what we do is we put the dog in a harness with a leash. Uh, we have a person that agitates the dog while the other person is holding the leash and the dog is lunging and we're pulling back to create opposition reflex to provoke frustration, to provoke reactivity so that we can build it towards controlled aggression. Okay. okay? So a lot of people put their dogs in harnesses because they don't want the dog pulling, putting pressure on the throat. Uh, or like they'll have what's called a no pull harness, which I think is what kind of what you have. Yeah, you have the front the clip. Yep. Front. Yeah. So uh, no pull harness for me is an oxymoron because uh, harnesses are meant for pulling. Huskies were harnesses to pull sleds. Uh, horses were harnesses to pull carriages. There's even those. Um, they do it like with pits and like power breeds where they wear harnesses to pull like those big heavy tires, right? Harnesses Actually, are meant my, for pulling. Uh, previous dog was a husky. In Part of the reason I always had the harnesses was he would uh, tow me places on the bike. <laughs> sure, you know, and in that case, that's fine because you were actively using that instinct, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're actually walking your dog, it gives you the least amount of control, but also is provoking the things that we don't want, okay? So uh, the reason why it's uh, not good with the flex leash is the flex leash actually, actually has warnings on the case. Have you seen those warnings? No. So there's risk of these breaking open. And what happens is because it's, a lot of tension uh, you're gonna it's gonna whip okay so this actually happened to a client where her dog snapped her flexi leash and she had scars all along her legs because it snapped back and just whipped around wow. and just cut her legs all over the place okay there's also like risk of decapitation or choke or something like if you look if you look go to a pet smart petco you pick up any flex leash and look on it you'll see three different warnings okay so if you have a harness on a dog which encourages pulling and you have a sizable dog if you have like a 15 pound yorkie or whatever i'm like who cares right they're most likely not going to put enough tension on that to break that but a guy like him could so the harness putting more tension on that thing is more likely to create the the breaking does that make sense yeah now the way you're holding it here would be smarter because you're you're absorbing any pulling tension that there may be but if it's going directly to that that's most likely where it's going to happen okay so a uh, flex leash and a harness paired together also give you the least amount of control because it's weird because of this thing, right? Because you have to like kind of twist it or turn it in or grab it. And these are like thinner and stuff that they're kind of uncomfortable to grab. So if your dog starts pulling, you kind of feel it cutting into your finger, right? So also it gives you the least amount of control, okay? We just use a regular leash, flat collar, and then the training collars, okay? 95% of the time we use strictly remote collar. Every now and then we'll incorporate a prong collar I don't go to prong collar as my first resort because it uh, takes too much technical skill for the owner. And most people are used to walking their dog like this. They're used to keeping the dog or holding the dog back, which is tension. Uh, so with the prong collar, the way it looks, it looks like a spiky thing, right? Yeah. Is it's meant to mimic a dog bite. That's why it's designed the way it's designed, okay? Most people look at it and they're like, oh, you're torturing the dog. You go, no, it's literally designed to mimic a dog bite, okay? So if you're always pulling on it, you create a biting pressure. Okay. If you never let go, the biting pressure is always on. The dog never learns what it is they're supposed to do because when you release the pressure, that tells them you did what I wanted. When you add the pressure that says you're doing something I don't want. Does that make sense? Yes. That's the communication. So uh, most people tend to already walk like this because they're used to their dog pulling and stuff. So if we're using a leash-based training tool, uh, people tend to get stuck. Okay. With remote collar, everything's at the press of a button. Okay. So. Uh, people still lock up, but because they're not really using the leash as much with the training, they're less likely to lock up and keep locked up, okay? Because uh, the remote is doing all the communication for us, okay? So, uh, we train, the only time I train a dog with both prong and e-collar right off the bat is like I had a lady, she was like 90, maybe 100 pounds, and she had like a 140 pound grade thing, okay? Who was leash reactive, and she lived in Bucktown. 
So I had to compensate for the fact that her, her dog was like one and a half times her size and she lived in Bucktown so she could literally turn the corner and there would be a dog, okay? So the prong collar gave her immediacy just in case she got caught off guard. The e-collar gave her the capacity to de-escalate the dog's reactivity without relying on physical strength, okay? okay? So the e-collar that we use has 127 levels, respective levels and in increments of one. Are you familiar with the e-collar technology at all? Um, generally, I mean, I've tested out the cheap one that I got on myself and the okay. bike and uh, I have an idea of how it feels and like, but that's about it. Okay, never so actually use them. Uh, it's a muscle stimulator. Have you ever been, uh, have you ever been, chiro uh, been to a chiropractor's office or a physical therapist? Uh, not really. No? Have you ever seen uh, those videos where they recreate labor contraction pains in men? No, but is it kind of like the, uh, like, ab workout things? That yeah, the yeah, 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 okay. okay. So it's a muscle stimulator, okay? So the technology is used on humans all the time, but the, the word of electric collar tends to kind of be off-putting. Uh, plus, in the, in the dog training world, there's a lot of drama between trainers like myself that use all methods versus trainers that only use positive only. Uh, they'll use words like shock, torture, pain, and all that to deter you from using these tools uh, or to guilt you into not using them. But you're not electrocuting your dog. It's not shocking your dog. It's this, literally just a muscle stimulator like the ab workout thing. Okay. okay. And I mean, I've seen the reward only thing. I tried that with the other dog because he wasn't housebroken when he mm -hmm. came home over a year. He still wasn't housebroken. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, the no. The, the punisher. That, yeah. That flipped the switch and he was housebroken. Yeah. It took once. Doing that. <laughs> so that's how punishers work. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have four quadrants, and you don't have to, like, they sound fancy, whatever, but really, so we have positive reinforcement, which is add something good. Positive punishment is add something bad. Negative reinforcement is take away something good. Negative punishment is take away something bad, okay? So th that's the easiest way to think about it, because people think uh, positive reinforcement is like, uh, it's um, like positive punishment because of the word positive. They think positive is good. It's good. I go, no, positive means add, okay? So it is, they're just fancy terms. But you added, in that moment, something bad and the dog goes okay i'm not going to do that again that's how that works okay so when we work with dogs with the remote collar it's technically techni technically positive punishment because we I can add something bad right mm -hmm. but then we can also remove something bad to condition the things that we want okay. okay so to give you an example if i have a leash reactive dog and they're lunging and barking and i turn on the collar and i start applying it right i'm adding something bad and then the dog stops being reactive i now take away the bad and the dog goes, oh, when I did this, and I'm lunching and barking, this turned on, I didn't like it. The moment I calmed down, the bad thing I don't like went away. So I'm gonna favor not being reactive. Does that make sense? Yes. So here, in your particular case, we wouldn't provoke your dog being bad, because that's what most people think, okay? Most cases is simply the lack of regular formal structure. Structure being uh, boundaries and consequences. So human structure and dog structure is a bit different. Human structure is I wake up, I let my dog to go potty, I feed him in the morning, I go to work, I come back, I let him up the potty, we go for a walk, I come back home, I feed him dinner, we chill out. That's human structure, more like a schedule, okay? Dog structure is what they can and can't do, and if and is there a consequence, okay? So let's take the other dog, for example. Dog's running around, crashes into him. You can't do that to me, right? He's sniffing the pool water. Dog comes around, hey, what's going on? Hey. This is my pool water, and I'm willing to fight you for it, right? You're at the farm. I don't want to go in the car. Oh, but we're going to go in the car. Hmm? No, we're not. Right? That is structure. He is establishing a boundary there. He's saying, we'll go when I decide we're ready to go. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's not what we would call aggression. That's actually all communication. Aggression is when a dog resorts to the behavior, and typically at a higher intensity, regularly. Okay? So it's like people with like anger management skills that just go straight into conflict or confrontation immediately for everything, right? They got some issues they got to work out. For dogs, it's similar, okay? So um, that's why in your case, I was like, he's learning to be a bully as opposed to actually being a bully or actually being a dog that I would be aggressive, okay? None of the stuff that he's doing is, is to me surprising because most of them are him establishing boundaries with... Um, with the exception of the first one, which is the whole panic thing, but that's more because of panic. It just opened them up to the possibility of, I can use this now for things I don't want. Mm -hmm. But that's the structure he's establishing, okay? So here, what we do is we start to add structure through heel, which is walking your dog on a leash, 
okay? Um, it allows us to layer in the e-collar in a non-confrontational manner, meaning we're not trying to provoke the problem, um, unless, uh, at least not initially. We're just trying to find reason to correct him, uh, to start teaching him, hey buddy, you can bite me, but I can bite you too, okay? And that can change a lot of stuff. Once a dog realizes that you have the capacity to essentially bite him back, it literally flips the switch. So I was raised old school, I was spanked, okay? When I was growing up, don't do that was just don't do that until I got spanked for the first time. Now don't do that had a totally different meaning because now it carried physical consequence. Does that make sense? Yes. So now if my mom said don't do that, I'm like, eh, I don't want to get spanked, right? So I go, okay, you know what, not worth it. I'm not gonna do that, okay? Same thing for dogs. So once you start to like bite them for stuff, Okay, even though it's not anything to do with the problem, it tar starts to change the psychology because the dog's like, oh, well, like now you have the capacity to correct me back. Okay, so what we do is we see when we implement structure, what does it resolve? Okay, so when people come in, they have all these issues, and I'll go, okay, 80% of that, 70% of that is really going to go away with the healing stuff. Okay, because it's just the dog being a jerk, it's just the dog thinking it can get away with anything, no one's ever corrected the dog before, blah, 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 blah. And they'll come back like, Jesus, Jesse, like 50% of the stuff is done. Like the leash reactivity, like half of it's done. And then I'll get feedback from them to let me know where like I need to tweak things. But for the most part, once you start adding regular structure and walking your dog and making them focus, uh, because if he's always overstimulated and on edge, remember he's already at threshold. So if the other dog comes barging in, that's gonna put him over threshold. So it would make sense that he's going to then act out. But if he's at a zero or a one and the dog comes barging in, it would take more for him to go to 9, 10, 11. That Does that make sense? Yeah. But if he's always living in the world at a six to seven, putting him to 10, 11 is very easy, okay? Just like with humans. If I'm already stressed out with stuff, right? And then I go to work and something else goes wrong, puts me over my threshold, right? So it's all the same, except with humans, um, since we're introspective and we can hold on to things, we can keep ourselves stuck. Whereas dogs will let things go. Okay, dogs don't hold on to things. He doesn't think like, man, last time you know you barged into me or blah blah blah. Like, like uh, uh, I'm gonna, I'm a, I'm a, how was that? I'm out to get you. Dogs don't do that. The moment you start giving them structure and consequence, we should start seeing them giving you calmness, um, discipline, um, passiveness back. Dogs are reactive. That you get what you give. Okay. So if you're giving rules, consequence, boundaries, uh, uh, holding them accountable for stuff, you're gonna get that dog in response as opposed to, hey bud, we go to the park or we go for a walk and you can sniff if you want, you can do whatever you want, you can wander wherever you want. You know, even though you shortened your leash and you've locked it, he's still in his own world. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. So like, let's say once you started the training, you'd literally show up and he'd either be sitting right next to you nice and calm or he'd probably lay down and fall asleep. Okay, because now he's going into the world in a calmer state. Is that making sense? Yes. It's hard for people to visualize, but once you see it, you're like, oh shit, like he wasn't lying. Like, <laughs> this is actually how it plays out, okay? Um, questions on any of that stuff? Not in particular, no. So then, what I would do here is, I know you're seeing this as behavior and to a degree it is. I would call this mild to maybe moderate type of behavior. Okay, it's nothing severe. It's not the obedience that's gonna help you and your dog. It's the discipline behind the obedience. It's the fact that you can give him physical, physical consequence through the remote collar that's gonna help him, okay? If you were, were like, hey Jesse, whenever this dog comes over, he just goes into straight up attack mode, like he can't even see him. Now we have a behavior. Now we have something that needs to be worked on. I need to now correct, uh, when he sees the dog, him just triggering into aggression, right? Here, this to me just sounds like a dog that's a brat and a bully. So once you start to add in that discipline, it should just line them up. Now the variable is the other dog, okay? So if you get him under control and he does really well and he's calming down, right? And then you take him over to your parents' house and he's now like this passive dog and the other dog keeps pestering at him or whatever and he wants nothing to do with that dog for whatever reason, something may happen, okay? Because no one's setting boundaries for that dog now. Does that make sense? Yes. So then you'd have to either advocate for him, uh, essentially establish a boundary and like, hey dog, my dog wants something to do with you, okay? 
Uh, and if like he decides he wants to play or whatever and they interact for a bit, but the moment you start seeing him like kind of like, okay, I'm done and kind of leaving the situation, if the other dog doesn't, you would have to step in because he's already giving sign of, I'm done playing now. I play with you for 10, 15 minutes, that's all I got, I'm done. But if the other dog's like, no, I need more, that's gonna push something. Cause he's going, man, I can't get away from you. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. So that's a separate issue of its own, but that's just something to keep you aware of because then he's not the problem. Yeah. Makes sense? And it would be unfair. So like, like let's say you're like, no, I'm gonna let the other dog, you know, pester him. And if he acts out, I'm gonna, I'm gonna punish him, right? Technically you could, but now you're creating this like unrealistic expectation for him where he's like, man, I have no say in this. Yeah. I can't get away from it. I have to just take it. And if anything, it heightens the dog even more. And then he might really lash out because he's really trying to suppress and the other dog won't leave him alone. Does that make sense? So it has to be a balance. So if I have a dog that's reactive and I bring him here and we do the training and everything, I expect him to be non-reactive, right? You're not going to lunge at dogs. And then let's say I get all that addressed. And then an off-leash dog comes over here, right? I wouldn't say like, you have no choice. You got to deal with it. I would shoo off that off-leash dog. So this dog goes, okay, cool, Jesse. I don't need to be reactive. I will be given consequence. But if I see an off-leash dog, you will take care of it. Okay. It is a balance. You know, there's what we need and want, and there's what the dog needs and wants as well. If it's just all about you, there's going to be conflict here, and then most likely you're going to see something come out in the future. Okay. So, like, if you look online where, where it says, like, oh, e-collar trainers just suppress behaviors, right? Meaning we just make the dog deal with shit. We make the dog deal with shit, yes, in a healthy fashion to teach them you don't need to do this, right? But at the same time, it's balanced out because we are the ones that are advocating so the dog doesn't feel like they have to do the thing that they do. Does that make sense? Yeah. Questions on any of that? Not, not too much in particular. I do think uh, if, well, it sounds like it would get to the point where it'd be useful to apply the same kind of training you're speaking about to my parents' dog mm -hmm. as well, which I do think they'd probably be open to. Uh, well, like my dad bought an e-collar lately because his his dog is being less and less responsive in terms of like we. I used to be able to be walking them out by the farm, making pounds of like deer shit or something, mm -hmm. you know, yell assertively and get him off yeah. of it. Now he just ignores me. Yeah. Same thing with my dad. So yeah. I think he might also be. Uh, receptive to the idea of formally, you know, yeah. So that's a separate thing, right? Training, yeah. Um, so they just have to be careful because if you, if they, because people tend to think of the e-collar as a punisher. My dog does something, does something bad, I can slam, whatever, right? But if you don't teach it correctly, and the dog doesn't understand what it is or why it's happening, uh, you risk creating more problems because now the dog thinks it's a random thing as opposed to a thing that turns on due to the choices they make. I see. Okay, so you drive? Yes. Uh, do you run red lights? No. Why not? Uh, cost and... Uh... <laughs> yeah, you get a ticket, maybe you crash, right? There's consequence there. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're aware of that because you're a human, you're self-aware, right? So you can just kind of apply these things. And then like, you know, back when you were learning how to drive and stuff, somebody explained this to you, you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And I don't want that to happen. So I'm gonna stop at a red lights, right? Mm -hmm. Dogs don't really do that. Dogs have to perform the behavior and, met be, and be met with a consequence in order for them to learn that's not acceptable, right? But they also have to understand why it's happening. Him biting the other dog resonates because dogs bite each other, okay? E-collar is not natural to dogs. It's just a muscle stimulator. So the dog's like, what the hell is that? So it can create more issues because the dog is, does not know what it is. It is unfamiliar. Plus, they don't understand how it turns on, how it turns off. So when we cover the leash walking exercise, this is actually what teaches your dog how it turns on, how it turns off, okay? The other thing is, let's say he does get very anxious with it, okay? The e-collar is not making your dog anxious. Your dog is already an anxious dog. Mm -hmm. E-collar is a stressor. Your dog's stress response is anxiety. So when you layer in the stressor, you're gonna see more anxiety, okay? Yeah. The difference is we would work the dog through it and then repeatedly expose the dog to it and then the anxiety starts to go down. The dog goes, oh, I understand this. This is a communicator. It's not a bad thing. It's actually telling me stuff. And I can control it pending what I do, the decisions I make, right? And then you start to see the dog settle. So I have a case right now that came from a, a previous trainer who they did a two-week boarding train, and they would pull out the collar, and the dog would already start shaking really crazy, right? 
And uh, it wasn't abuse, it's that the, they layered the collar in incorrectly, the dog didn't understand it. The dog didn't understand it did stuff, but they didn't understand why it did stuff, okay? So I had to retrain the dog, we did heel stuff, and I said, this is gonna help your dog learn how to turn it on, how to turn it off, and I said, go practice this for two weeks. It came back two weeks later, the dog was calm as can be, no longer running away from the collar, because now the dog understands what it is, okay? So, um, most people tend to think of it as, oh, my dog doesn't listen, to nail them, right? You can also you also risk sending your dog running because they want to run away from the thing that they don't that, that they don't know what it is. The first instinct, so it's fight or flight, right? So something happens and it's like, well, I don't know what the fuck I'm gonna fight. You're gonna run, yep. okay? So now there's the risk of potentially sending the dog running away, okay? So, um, question on any of that stuff? Nothing comes to mind at the moment. Um, so, for your particular case, I feel like this is fairly straightforward. Okay, I don't think this is complicated. Um, I would most likely recommend, so we have three, six, nine, and 12 week programs, one day a week for an hour. Uh, I'd most likely, it sounds, it, you're, it sounds like um, you're, you're concerned with the behavioral stuff, mm -hmm. right? Um, is there anything else that you would need your dog to do behavior wise or obedience wise, or is it really just like, I have this problem and I just want to fix it? Um, I mean, that's the primary concern, just to keep, you know, injuries and everything down in between the dogs yeah. and everything i mean i would like to uh improve he's actually better than most dogs i've had uh off leash but okay. i do like to keep him do like to be able to keep him off leash when we're at the farm and the like uh walking around through the forest and all that and he is pretty responsive for the most part i've even been able to recall him from like chasing deer at some points mm -hmm. but it's not a hundred percent for sure yeah near a hundred percent yeah that was kind of an anomaly with the deer. I can typically call him back if he hasn't like locked on to prey, no problem. Mm -hmm. But if he has, you know, found something to follow, then maybe a thirty percent success rate. So okay. that's something. Yeah, yeah we need to fix that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's usually what I recommend. So I would put you at a six class program. Okay. So uh heal is two classes that has to happen. So class one you show up, I work with you here. I don't need to touch your dog. Okay, you show up with your dog, you have the equipment, and I'll go over that with you later. Um, and I walk you through everything real time. So if he ends up getting anxious or whatever, uh, if, there's, if there's hiccups, I walk you through it, you do it yourself, okay? And then I give you your homework, rinse and repeat, come back a week later, okay? You give me feedback, uh, any changes in behavior, does he seem calmer, blah, blah, blah. And then we do the second half of the deal, you know, rinse and repeat, come back the next week, okay? Uh, but the, the next class, um, in order for us to see if there's any progress with the behavioral stuff, right, you would have to start kind of putting yourself in the setting where it's like, oh yeah, when he's with the other dog, he seems calmer or more chill, but the other dog is still being a little bit of a pest and I can see him being bothered with it. Then I go, okay, well then now you need to address that dog. I can go over how to do it. You know, it's not, it's not difficult. Um, it's literally just saying like, my dog wants something to do with you, like go do something else, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, whether, or not, whether or not the dog does it, completely different thing. Okay, um, and then going into the recall by the third class. Okay, um, re recall, easy to teach, just takes a long time to get off leash reliable. To give you a concept, I have a client, I trained her first dog, I'm training now her second dog, and uh, with her boyfriend, and she mentioned to her boyfriend, her first dog took six months before she got it to the point where she felt that she was off leash reliable. Okay, reason being is uh, when you go out into the environment, you have to hope that there's distractions, hope the dog will go off and explore, uh, take the time to actually go to practice the recall, hope the weather is nice, you know, and in some cases when we start the recall training, the dog won't even leave your side because they don't want to be corrected or, you know, remoted. So then they tend to hover next to you, which creates a separate problem, right? There's all these variables that come into play. So recall takes the longest to teach, which is why I try to get it in as soon as possible, okay? Uh, the next thing I'd most likely teach is stationary control, which is like the sit still. It's like, let's say you went to your, your parents' house or whatever, the dog's gonna be there and you don't wanna to have to worry about them like intermingling and wandering around or whatever. You could tell him to go to his dog bed. He would lay there two to three hours, four hours, five hours, an hour, 30 minutes. You pick and choose, okay? So now you know, okay, my dog is minding his business, which makes it easier for me to address the other dog. Does that make sense? Yes. And likewise, if they did the same, if they, if they get the same training or whatever, they also would have the same ability of like, okay, we can have our dog walk without pulling, we can recall our dog and our have our dog stay, um, stay still. Now, if, there is a starting to build, uh, be what we call like a um, tension, where he's just starting to like less and less dislike or, or more and more dislike the other dog, right? Mm -hmm. We cannot make him like the dog again. 
Yeah. Okay. Like it, it, it happens. Like I get cases where the dogs are fighting internally within the home. Okay. And, t- and a lot of times when that happens, I'll tell the owners, good luck going back to what it was, what it was before. Most likely going forward, it's going to be like military lifestyle. Okay. Because the dogs will literally try to kill each other. And I was like, and at that point, if you're trying to keep both dogs, it literally has to be militant type um, structure, rules, boundaries. Otherwise, you give them any inch, they're going to go at it again. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, your case isn't there. He's in response to things, right? Uh, but if left unaddressed, potentially, it just continues to happen. And next thing you know, you have a, a bigger issue. Yeah. Okay. Now, when it comes to like the car, the car thing, uh, that really shouldn't be a problem because now you'd have a tool that would just make him go in the car. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? And the moment you start to like making the dog do stuff, like you see all this here, mm-hmm. like it, it looks cute, right? He's on his back, and all that, right? But for me, all this is overstimulation. This is again, he's just he cannot relax. Yes. Okay. So once you start pushing through things and making the dog do stuff, even if he doesn't want to do it, a lot of that resistant behavior starts to go away. Okay. Because he's like, well, there's no point because I know Dad will make him do it anyways. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, in the beginning, when we start the training, because he's gone three years of his life, correct? Yes. Without being made to do something, we may see protest behavior. Protest behavior might be biting and pulling the leash. It might be alligator rolling. Uh, you might see the dog become really resistant, yipping, yelping, because they, they just I don't want to do this. It's all part of the process. We work them through it, okay? If we don't work them through it and we stop and or try to reset, your dog now learns, I can stop the thing I don't like by doing this behavior, okay? So uh, when we see these responses, again, it, the person thinks or feels like, oh, that's bad. I go, yeah, it's bad. It's not good. I don't want the dog to do that. But they're doing it because they don't want to do the thing we need them to do. So if we cave into that, the dog goes, great, I don't need to do it now. Mm-hmm. Now we have unreliable control and obedience. So if he's fully off leash chasing that deer, maybe he comes back, maybe he doesn't. But if I work him through it, I'm like, hey, you can pull the leash, you can alligator roll, you can yip, you can yelp, you can roll on the ground, you can... I've had dogs flop on the ground and act like dead weight. I'm like, you can do all that stuff. It ain't gonna work. That when I need my obedience to absolutely be functional, it's gonna happen. Because the dog's like, every time I, every time dad tells me to do something, they have to do it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, and then with the remote collar, if he's deep into prey drive or whatever, you have the ability to still override through the remote, as opposed to if he's fully off leash and you have no real connection, there's no real way to reinforce it. Okay. So yeah, I'll put you at six classes. Classes five and six. I would treat as variables. Let's say the behavioral stuff does pop up. We have classes to target it. Mm-hmm. But most likely what I would do is everything, if everything is moving as I think it should, which is very clear cut, because um, again, I don't think he's really the issue. I think it's just, uh, oh, his overstimulation, the other dog's overstimulation, and both of them together not being a good combination, okay? Mm-hmm. Is I would help you advance your what training you know to an off-leash level, okay? So off-leash level control, isn't complicated it just takes more time and repetition okay and you're and there's phases to things so it's not like i train the dog and then one day i take the leash off and that's it there's stages okay so we work through all the stages until it's like okay cool i've proofed my dog i'm fairly confident i'm like 99 percent confident he's not going to take off on me or if i call him he's i'm on 99 percent confident he's going to respond to me okay and that one percent i have this tool that's going to help me return my dog or whatever okay so it's really because the methods that we use are off-leash methods. It's just a, uh, a matter of is the owner willing to put in the time and effort to yeah, um, cool. to build the dog to that level. Okay. Uh, questions on any of that? Um, not too much. Just uh, to the point of uh, the other dog. Like, yeah. Um, say, like, because I know my dad's interested in having getting further training. Uh huh. But say, if he wasn't going to be available or something like that. Would it be effective if, for example, like I were to attend training sessions with that dog, or is it more that you really need to? It would have to be them. The yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. So, like, let's say I train your dog, your parents train their dog uh, simultaneously or whatever. Um, it would be more beneficial for them to, like, if they go out of town or whatever, to just push back the training and then come back to do it themselves. But then, if you needed to walk the dog or whatever it'd be easy because you already know what to do. It's the same. Exactly, yeah. So uh, the dog should always be trained by the primary handler or handlers. Mm-hmm. So in this case, it'd be your parents. Okay. okay. Um, other questions? Um, that was the main one that came up for. Okay. Uh, just um, so you're aware, it's best to have consistency amongst the, the dogs. In your case, uh, 
both your dogs. Okay. Yes. Now. Uh, oh, okay. That was something I was thinking earlier. Uh, just in general, um, because I guess my other dog's behaviors are a little more normal, at least uh, mm -hmm. in my experience, just sort of the leash reactivity. And he is small, but he will like, I'll notice when he's at the dog park, you know, he'll hang out by the entrance. I'll have to check out every dog coming in and dogs that are larger than him. He will try to play alpha with. He will mm -hmm. try to go and put his head up over their shoulder or yeah. whatever, even if they're twice his height. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, is that something basically to discuss him? Should that be a separate consultation, nope. or since that's a more normal thing? No. Nope. Yeah. Just so. With the what I would suggest is um, so I, you don't have to pay a program each dog. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you buy a program, you're paying for my time. I show up and I go when needs to be done. Okay, uh, so if you want to train both dogs, you can get them done under one program. What we would suggest is that you extend the first two classes by half an hour. That gives us 45 minutes to work with one dog, 45 minutes to work with the second dog. Okay, typically after the first two classes, we're able to get uh, both the dogs done within an hour. Okay, because the concepts are, are the same. Okay, now if you want to make sure they have equal time, because every dog does respond a little bit differently. Um, just to make sure they have equal time, you can always extend the, the classes. But I don't, I always tell people, do the first two, we see how things play out, and then if needed, you can add on half an hour set, uh, additions, whatever, to the second, to the other classes as well, okay? Um, so then I think it's like 75 bucks for like an additional 30 minutes to the training. So instead I mean, of paying the like, yeah. Yeah, so you don't have to pay, each dog isn't their own program. So since one dog is under you, or these two dogs are under you, you just buy one program, extend the time. Okay. I guess it occurs to me, uh, the one key thing I think would be to know about the other one. Mm -hmm. Well, he was about a year home, year old, roughly, when he followed me home, and uh -huh. had no training. And then uh, I don't necessarily know how he, because he, I was walking my old dog when he came up to us, uh -huh. and they, you know, sniffed, said hello, and it was, fine and he followed me home yep. and I don't necessarily know how reactive he was to other dogs before this incident with uh, within a couple of weeks of him staying with me uh -huh. I was walking him and a very large pit bull had gotten off its leash from across the street mm -hmm. charged over and actually kind of looked at him because he's 35 pounds and kind of ignored him but actually went to attack my uh, other dog other dog who was the husky and he was 16 years old at that yeah. point yeah and the little one actually popped in uh, in between them, but he ended up getting mauled pretty badly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got his neck torn up real good before I could get the dog off of him. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a lot of the basis of his. Yeah, it can be. To other dogs. Hundred percent. Because um, this is a very common story that I get. Mm -hmm. Is like I've had clients whose dogs are uh, social dogs. They get attacked by an off leash dog, and the next day they're just like dog reactive and dog aggressive. Oh, and he did. He definitely. Yeah became much more leash reactive specifically yeah. after that incident because he was leashed when yeah because it creates out. distrust mm -hmm. so now any dog theoretically could be a threat mm -hmm. okay but it can always be addressed okay, okay. so um and then like with the six class program uh you know like let's say everything's going really well right um and then it's like for whatever reason maybe his reactivity is a little bit more comp like uh, if he's being more stubborn with it or whatever we have like classes five and six to then like okay we thought he was a problem child he was actually pretty straightforward the reactivity is actually a problem we can address that okay if you want more of a buffer between like just in case like you have them so we, the, the longer the program the cheaper the program right because you're paying you're, you're saying i want you for x amount of time so we go cheaper per class rate is you could do nine and that gives you more of a buffer just in case like uh, the react because since i don't know the other dog i haven't seen or whatever yeah. And unfortunately for, so pities, even though your guy's only 35 pounds, uh, the saying, it's not about the, it's a, not the dog in the fight, size of the fight, dog in the fight, but the size of the fight of the dog is 100% true. Okay, so I have a case right now, severely reactive, one of the worst cases I've ever seen. Uh, her number is 127 on a collar meant for a Rottweiler, and it's only a 20 pound dog. Okay, and I recognize this from the get go. And it took me to the fourth class to finally, no, the third class, the third class we finally squashed it. Because I just said, go to max power. Because it was a 20 pound dog. You know, so you're like, logically speaking, you're like, I shouldn't need this much, but her intensity was crazy. I just saw her two weeks ago for her fourth class, no reactivity. Dropped like 
okay, because we met the dog where she needed to be. So logic says this dog is small and shouldn't need a lot, but it's not about logic, it's about what the dog needs. So I don't know until I see it and I'm actually in it, mm -hmm. uh, but everything makes sense. Like logically, it's not like coming to slam the dog. Like we, we, we start low, we work our way up, okay? Mm -hmm. Your dog determines the number, we do not. If your dog responds to 15 and everything is perfect at 15, we operate at 15. If your dog needs 45 or 90, we're at 45 or 90, okay? Uh, but yeah, if you want a little bit of a buffer, uh, we could, you could, you know, do nine. And then all it is is more time to build your guy, both dogs, to a higher level of control. Um, and then it gives us a big old, a bigger, big old, a bigger wiggle room in case maybe it's not going as smoothly with this guy or the other dog. Now we've kind of accounted for that because we have those extra classes. Yeah, I think that's probably a good idea because especially if we want to work on off-leash stuff, he is much less uh, responsive okay. for the uh, off-leash things. I normally just keep him staying closer to me when we're off-leash as opposed to letting him range further out. Okay. The further out I let him go, the less uh, he listens. Okay. So what I would recommend for you in terms of the collar and everything is because... Um, they don't make a two dog version of the collar I would make recommend. Um, you have to you have to uh, piecemeal it. Okay, so you buy the remote separately and then you pair two collars to the remote and now you have a, a remote that controls two dogs. Okay. Uh, the, uh, and, and Tina will send you the information for all this stuff. Okay. Uh, but the collar I recommend is the Dr. Black Edition. Um, it's, the, it's the best collar there is. It's meant for a 70 pound dog and over. I know your pity is 35 pounds, you said, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not, account, I'm not thinking like, oh, this is a 35 pound dog. I'm going, okay, it's a power breed. Uh, Pitties are, they were bred to withstand pain and discomfort because they were bred for fighting and stuff. Okay. So I would rather you have it. And in case you, it's like, I'm gonna have it and not need it kind of person, as opposed to try to go with something that's lower power. And then it's okay. like, hey, this isn't working well. And then you have to, you know, exchange it and do all that other stuff. Um, I feel like that would be your best bet. And this way you know you're going into it like, this is the best tool there is. Uh, I don't have to worry about is this gonna work or not, okay? We also wanna account for prey drive. So like, let's say this guy takes off, he sees a deer. We now have your dog running. We have, uh, you know, the fur coat, which acts as a buffer. Uh, we have the dog in drive, he sees the deer, right? We have all these things in, in play that we wanna make sure that we have enough power to cut through all that to make sure that we can actually get through the dog to like tell him like, get your ass back over here, okay? So I, I, I think of the collar also in emergency situations is am I gonna have enough output to cut through everything so I can still communicate with my dog, okay? Uh, and that would be the, the best tool and it's perfectly safe to use. I could put it on my eight pound chihuahua. It's perfectly fine. You just get more from less because it's a higher output, okay? So you get more out of lower levels than you would with the other collars, okay? Uh, any other questions? Uh, not really, not at the moment. Um, oh, you said for the collars, just a normal flat yep, collar. Yep, regular flat collar okay. and then a regular leash. Uh, if you're going to be doing both, we'll see how they do. Mm -hmm. uh, more often than not, we can get the owner to walk both dogs with just the e-collar and whatever. In some cases, uh, the owner may need the prong collar just to give them leverage because you are walking two dogs. Okay. And I'd assume then, because uh, I do have like one of the split leashes, but that results in a lot of pulling. So yeah, you do two separate leashes. leashes. Yeah, they don't need to be fancy. They're probably like 10, 12 bucks. Mm -hmm. A very simple, you know, uh, three, I, like the, I like the three quarter inch, like the width of your thumb. I'm not a big fan of big thicker ones because when you're holding two dogs, it's, it's a lot, it just takes up too much room in your hands. Once you start to get the control and the training in, you realize like you really don't even need that stuff because mm -hmm. it's all about controlling this. Once you control this, you control everything else. Okay, but we tend to do like big, thick chain leashes or whatever because we're thinking, oh, this is a big dog. I need to make sure I have security. It's, it's really just comes down to good training. Okay, uh, if you'd like to get in, a con did you watch any of our training videos by chance? I've watched some of them. Okay, so if you go to my website, canineperspective.com and you go to the, if you scroll up a little bit, you'll see like a video of a pit bull like smiling in the sun. If you click on that video, it's a really good one to watch. It's, it's a behavioral video, like reactivity and stuff, but I explain everything. Okay, the dog's name is Lake. It's like a, a fawn or a light brown tannish color pity. And you see where she's being reactive towards me, she's being reactive towards dogs in my facility. And then by the end of the class, she's nice and passive and I'm able to touch her and she's not freaking out. But I, I break it down, like I'm actually explaining it as opposed to just watching the raw video. So you kind of get an idea. And it's a part of a playlist called Dog Training and Client, Client Highlights. 
And in that playlist, it's like a bunch of videos of me breaking things down in a shorter context as opposed to like watching a fully one hour, hour and a half long yeah, training I think session. Yeah, watch a few of the like shorter videos yeah, yeah. of that at one point. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, nothing out the ordinary, nothing I've not seen before. So if you have any questions you may have forgotten to ask, you can ping Tina, and if they pertain to me, she'll email me. I'll get back, I'll get back to her. She'll follow up with you. Otherwise, um, if you want to expedite the process, you know, you can email us and say, hey, Tina, sign me up. I would like nine classes, six classes, what have you. I'm signing up two dogs. I have to do half an hour for the first two. Here's my schedule, okay? Because that's what she's going to ask you for. So sending the schedule just alleviates a little bit of that time, and she would send you our contract. Once the contract is submitted, she knows you're serious, okay? And then she'll proceed. We are first come, first serve. Uh, so if anybody's submitting their forms before us and getting the payment in, they're obviously booking, and then she'll get to you once, once she's done booking them, okay? Um, otherwise, if you have any questions about the contract, feel free to ask. But once she has that, she knows, okay, you're ready to go, and then she'll start getting the booking process started, okay? All right, sounds All right. Good. it was a pleasure. Yeah, if you have any so questions, much. like I said, let us know, okay? Right, Take care. Enjoy your weekend. Get a walk.